Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Tonight we continue on with verse number 80, which reads as follows. Udakanhi nayanti netika usukara namayanti tejanang darung namayanti tajaka atanang damayanti pandita which means Udakang is water Udakang hi Nayanti They lead Netika the, the people who lead water The leaders Or the irrigators Is often translated Direct the water Irrigators direct water Usukara The arrow makers or fletchers Namayanti tejanang straighten their shafts, the shaft of the arrow. Darung namayanti tajaka carpenters straighten wood or carve wood, lead guide wood. The, the word here is namayanti means to guide or to lead, but the point is they finesse it or they work with it. Atanang damayanti pandita But the wise uh, train their minds So we have some fairly powerful imagery here And we have one of the more heartwarming stories of the Dhammapada and Again it's a back story so it has to do with past lives and so on And there's some that's Potentially an exaggeration And there's a lot that many people will ha find hard to swallow But I'll streamline it anyway So it shouldn't be that big of a deal Remember, it's just a story And whether or not any of it actually happened It makes a good story And has a good moral to it Of course, the moral has a lot to do with giving Which a cynic might say is convenient For monks to talk about giving to Buddhist monasteries and give, giving to Buddhism and I understand that, I mean I wouldn't say it if I didn't um, but it stands it still stands regardless of how important you think giving is giving is good so this has to do with giving but it has more to do with one's good intentions the story goes there was this in the time of Kasapa Buddha there was a there was a town or a kingdom. What was it? Oh, Benares. It was in Benares, uh, Varanasi. And uh, the Bodhisattva, or the Buddha, was dwelling there. Kasapa Buddha was dwelling there, and so people would uh, invite monks as they saw fit. So. They might invite eight monks, this family might invite ten monks, this family might invite one monk. But they would invite, their own family would invite a monk to come and eat at their house. And so there was some kind of system set up for that. But then one day when, when they were listening to the Dhamma, one man, who was sort of a wise man, was listening to the Dhamma and, and the Buddha mentioned the different different results of giving if you give but you don't urge others to give uh, then the the result is that you're you're you will receive in the future uh, opulence but you won't have a retinue you won't have friends to share it with whereas if you uh, if you urge others to give but you don't give yourself, then you'll have a lot of friends, but you won't have much wealth yourself or opulence, your affluence yourself. If, on the other hand, you don't give and you don't urge others to give, then you'll have neither. But if you give and you urge others to give, or you could generalize this and say, if you do good things, help others, are kind, are moral, this kind of thing, and you urge others in the same, then you'll both receive good karma and have 
friends to share it who will share it with you. And this man listening to this, he thought to himself, I'm going to get both of those for myself. And so he went to the Buddha afterwards and he asked, how many monks are there living with you? I think the story says there were 20,000, but let's just say it was a lot. A lot of monks. I mean, hey, in Thailand now there's there's got to be 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand. Uh, but in one city there were a lot of monks. And so he said, I would like to invite them all for a meal tomorrow. And so the Buddha accepted by staying silent. And this man went back to the town and he told everyone, he said, I've invited all the monks for lunch and I want all of you to help me. And so he wrote down on a piece of paper, he came on up to people and he said, you know, or he had people come to him and tell him how many monks they were going to uh, support and he arranged it all. So the idea was that it would be a single almsgiving as a group so that they could all share in the, in the goodness of their deed together as opposed to each house doing it on their own. And so he went around to everybody and, and some people would take many, some people would take a few, some people would say 20, some people would say 100, some people would say 500. And he went up eventually to this uh, poor, poor man who his name was Mahadugata. Mahadugata means one who is greatly at uh, disadvantage or in a really bad place. Dugata means one who has gone to a bad, to, to uh, suffering, is in hardship, so in great hardship. So his name literally means one who is in great hardship. So whether it was his name or just a description of him, but that's how he is referred to as Mahadugata. He came up to him and he said, "Would you like to help?" And he said, "How can I? How can I get involved? I can't. I have no money. I, it's very hard for me to even make enough money to live by." And the man said, "Well, don't you think, looking at these people who live in in affluence and and have everything that they want, while doing nothing to deserve it, don't you think that that well, well you work hard, they, so they don't have to work at all, and you have to work hard and don't get anything? Don't you think there's a result?" This is a result from the past, because they had heard all about karma and how it affects you in the next life. And so he said, I, you're probably right, you know, there's probably a cause from the past for this. And the man said, well, then, you know, find some way. Don't you think you should find some way to do good deeds? He said, you, sure, you, surely you can find some way to do, uh, to, to work and to make enough money to support one monk. And the man was moved and with this sort of sense of religious urgency. And he said, put me down for one monk. And he, I don't, you know, come hell or high water, I'll find a way to support one monk. But this man, who is supposed to have been a wise man, made a mistake. He didn't write down the name. Uh, he didn't write down the man's name on the paper thinking, what is one monk? No, surely there will be, I guess it was like, surely there will be a monk left over. I don't need to write that down. I don't need to reserve him one monk. We'll see about that. Mahadugata goes home to his wife and tells her, and being a, a wise woman herself, she doesn't reprove him by saying, how could you do that when we have nothing to give? What were you thinking? She says, we'll find a way. And so he goes out and find some wealthy man who's actually uh, working to, to uh, provide for like a hundred monks or even five hundred monks, three hundred monks. And uh, he says, you know, is there any work you have for me? Well, what can you do? Well, I can do this, whatever you want me to do. Okay, then he says, split some wood. And this poor, poor man uh, goes at it with such vigor and such zest and, and with such happiness that the uh, the master or the, the rich guy is, is really impressed and he asks, why are you working with such energy? And he says, with the, with the, resu with the fruit of my labor I'm I'm, I have the opportunity to provide a monk with food for a day. 
and the merchant, the, the rich guy, is, is, is impressed by this and moved by it, right? Because it's moving that someone would, would really think to, do, to, to, to uh, work so hard uh, to, to do a good deed for another person. And he, so he he remarks himself on how how special this is. And when when the poor man has finished his labor, instead of giving him his ordinary wage, he gives it in, he gives him a portion of rice. He gives him twice as much as he normally would. Meanwhile, his wife goes and does the same thing. She goes and. Uh, goes to find work with uh, um, the merchant's wife, actually. And the same thing happens. She works with such vigor that the woman gives her twice her pay. And at this time she gives her some money. And on top of that she gives her some other things as well. And they're so happy because now they have enough rice to give a simple meal to this one monk that's going to come and visit them. And they get back home, but then they realize they don't have any herbs uh, or uh, vegetables to go with it, you know, any kind of greens to go with it. And what are we going to do? And, and the wife says, go, go, to, uh, go down to the river and pick some weeds, uh, pick some wild um, greens. You know? I mean, obviously it, it's not going to be great fare, but what can we do? This is all we've got. And so the man goes down and he, he, he finds... He goes to the, he finds these these green leaves that are sort of a coarse fare that no one else would bother picking. But he's so happy because he has this opportunity to give. And there just happens to be a fisherman fishing uh, in the river. And he sees him and he says, "Why are you so happy?" And he said, "I'm giving food to a monk." And he said, uh, he said, "With those leaves, boy, you're really going to spoil him or something like that." And he says, well, what can I do? This is all I've got. I don't have any any money to, to buy anything else to put. So basically all they had was rice and some maybe some milk or some ghee, you know, some butter. But they had no vegetables, no meat or anything. So this was what he was going to put with the rice, was just some weeds, basically. But he said, what can I do? You know, I'm not a rich man. And the fisherman says, well, very well, then you take these fish that I've caught and string them up in bunches, meaning work for me and I'll, I'll see, I'll, I'll help you out. And so he works for him and by the time they're finished selling all the fish, there's, uh, there's none left and the man says, are there any fish left? No. And so he says, okay, well these are the fish that I had left over and they, ha they are some kind of red scaled fish or something. Red fish. Uh, and he gives them to him, these four fish. And so now not only does he have greens, but he has fish to offer to, the, to this monk. I mean, at this point, something has to be said about the... Uh, you, have to, you have to remark on how goodness um, attracts goodness. This is a part of how karma works. You know, When you are a good person doing good things, people want to help you, want to get involved. Anyway, we'll talk more about that after. So he goes back with the fish and they begin to prepare their food. They get back to the house and meanwhile a couple of things have been happening. First of all, the Buddha has noticed. And the Buddha has noticed that this guy has not been written down on a leaf. On the leaf. He hasn't been written down on the list. His name isn't on the list. The second thing that happens is Saka, the king of the god, the king of the angels, in the heaven of the 33, his throne begins to heat up. And his throne heats up, it's apparently a thing, that his throne he he heats up whenever anyone is doing something so good that they might have the potential to overthrow him, to, be, to, to rise up to a state better than him and thus become the leader of the angels of the 33 something like that anyway it gets warm so it's not hot yet but it's quite warm 
because Saka himself did great things to be born as Saka. So it's not like he's going to be overthrown by any simple deed, but it gets warm nonetheless. And so he looks to see who is it that has been doing this great deed. And he finds out and he says, this is, this is going to be an amazing thing that's going to happen today. And so he says, I better get involved. I better go down and help this guy out. And so he goes down and he disguises himself as an ordinary person and he walks up near this hut where this poor man and his wife live, this poor couple live. And he says, is anyone looking for someone to, is anyone looking to hire a cook or something like that? Uh, or is there anything, are you looking for someone to work for you? And they say, well, what can you do? And they come out and they say, what is this? What can you do to help us? I can cook. And he says, well, we have no money to pay you. And he says, well, that's fine. Uh, I understand you, pro you intend to provide food for a monk. Well, just let me share in the merit and that will be my pay. Hmm? And indeed it will be. And so he says, look, I'll start cooking here. You go and fetch the monk. And so the, this man is overjoyed with all the help that he's gotten, which is you know, pretty neat when you have good intentions and then people help you out with it. So he goes to the monastery and sure enough, he goes up to the man who's arranging, sending monks off, and all the monks have gone off by this time. And he says, okay, give me my one monk. Tell me which monk it is. And the man freezes. And he says, I'm sorry, I didn't write you down. And there is no monk for you. And this guy, he, he, uh, it says he feels as though, it felt as though a sharp dagger had been thrust in his belly. Can you imagine, you know, just being so worked up about this and so pushing yourself so hard, you know. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. Most of us wouldn't think to, to put ourselves out so much just to do an ordinary deed of goodness. But this was something significant for him. He'd never had the thought even to do, to give charity. I mean, being a poor person, why, why would he have that thought, right? And so the, the, how hard it was for him to come, to just swallow this and, and undertake it. And then the work that he had put in and the expectation and the joy that had come with it only to be denied. And it's true, there were no monks left. And he starts crying. And the people who were gathered in the monastery, they came and asked what's going on. And he told them, and oh, they turned on this guy. And they said, how could you? How could you? How could you? Because he had encouraged this guy, right? He had been the one to instigate the whole thing. And then to not even save him a monk. How terrible. And they were ready to lynch him. And so he turns to the guy. And he thinks quick. And he was... He was quite smart. It turns out he, he did have quite a bit of wisdom, just made a pretty silly mistake. And he says to him, please don't ruin me. I'm, this is, I'm going to be ruined if, if, if we don't solve this. He says, all the monks are gone. I don't even have a monk for my home. There's no monks left for me to feed even. Otherwise I'd give you the monk in, in my home for sure. But I can't take a monk from someone else who I've promised them this he says but there's only, there's one thing you couldn't do take your bowl no don't take your bowl it doesn't have a bowl go to the Buddha go the Buddha right now is sitting in his kuti surrounding the kuti are kings princes ri rich men and People of all uh, station in society, of high station in society, waiting for the Buddha to come out and give one of give his bowl to one of them. But Buddhas, Buddhas are um, wise, so in, inestimably wise, and often show favor to those with the greatest intention and with the greatest need. So if you have merit. 
he will he will bestow it bestow this favor on you so the man goes up walks up to the hut walks up to the walks to the monastery so sorry he wasn't in the monastery yet he goes up to the monastery and the people in the monastery the, the kings and the princes and the rich people say to him and said Look, this isn't the time for a handout because normally he would come to beg. You know? And so they say, "What are you doing here, beggar? This is not the time to beg." And he said, "I know, I know, it's not time to time for me to get a meal. I'm here to pay respect to the teacher." And so he walked up to the kuti, tears in his eyes, and bowed down on the porch of the kuti where the Buddha was living, paid respect with his head and said, Reverend Sir, in this city there is no man poorer than I. Be my refuge, bestow favor upon me. And the Buddha opened the door, and ignoring the princes and the kings and the rich folk, gave his bowl to the poor man. That's the story. All of the kings and the princes and the rich people immediately were shocked and scrambled to talk to this uh, poor man and said, "Look, we'll buy it from you. What do you? What need do you have uh, for almsgiving? We'll give you money. I'll give you thousand gold coins, ten thousand gold coins, a hundred thousand gold coins." And he said, "I don't need money. All I need is to give food to this one monk." And so he led the Buddha to his house, but the king of the city followed after, thinking, there's no way, there's no way this guy's going to have any food to give. So once the Buddha sees that there's not sufficient food to give, I'll take him back to the palace and feed him with proper food. Meanwhile, Saka, the king of the gods, the king of the angels, is preparing angel food. And we all remember from Anuruddha. Didn't we have the story of Anuruddha? Where we know what angel food cake is like, angel food is like. So they get there, and of course it's a sumptuous meal, and the king departs, and uh, the Buddha eats. And other magical things happen that I'm not going to relate. But through all of the goodness of this guy, this was the guy who was born when he passed away he was he passed away and was born in heaven yada 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 and eventually was reborn as pandita in the time of our buddha so it's a common thing the common theme in the dhammapada to have these grandois stories of goodness from the past it really has nothing to do with our our verse to tell you the truth it's just a nice story to tell I don't know, it's a little bit, as I said, it's a little bit um, self-serving in a sense. Here I am talking about giving food to monks, but that's not really the point. It's The point is goodness, you know, and charity in general, and a person's intentions and how it leads to good things. But the point is, with all that goodness and all of the good intentions in his mind, he was born as this young boy who at seven years old knew what he wanted. In fact, the story goes that when he was in his mother's womb, his mother had the urge to wear uh, orange-colored robes and go and listen to the Buddha's teaching. And, and also to eat red fish, which was <laughs> kind of funny, because red fish was what he fed to the Buddha. But she had this craving during her pregnancy to eat red fish. So I wonder if that's... They talk about pregnancy cravings. I wonder if there's anything to that. Uh, but okay, so when he was and then when he was born, when he was seven years old, he asked his mother permission to become a novice. She gave him permission, and he went forth. And on his first day, Sariputta was his teacher, and Sariputta led him into the village in the late morning, 
because he wanted to Sariputta generally went late because he wanted to check and make sure that the monastery was in order and also because this novice was new and so he wanted to take him separately so he could make sure that he did he behaved himself but on the way this is how the story goes and it's how it relates to the verse on the way he saw these things he saw water he saw these men leading water ir irrigators directing water into the fields and he saw how they could direct water and then he saw these um, the Fletchers straightening the shafts of wood heating it up and straightening it to make arrow shafts and he thought that these realized how they could how they work to straighten things out and finally he saw carpenters carving wood or shaping wood And he thought to himself, these people do this with, with these inanimate objects. This is exactly how I should act towards the mind. At seven years old, somehow he knew this. And so he, he turned around, didn't even go for alms food. In fact, the story says he sent Sariputta on alms for him, which Sariputta did without thinking. Sariputta was the most humble humble person imaginable it's quite amazing and a good good um, example for all of us here he is the chief disciple of the Buddha the number one guy the right hand man of the Buddha and here's the seven year old novice saying because uh, the novice would carry Sariputta's bowl for him giving Sariputta back his bowl and saying get me some food as well uh, he told him to get him some red fish And Sariputta did it without thinking, because he was completely humble, had no arrogance about him. Probably he would have admonished the novice if the novice had bad intentions, but he also could see that this novice had only the best of intentions. So the novice went back um, and was in Sariputta's kuti and meditating. And long story short, there's a little bit more, but long story short, he became light. Became an arahant, and so the Buddha gave this talk in that regard. He gave this, spoke this verse, according to Pandita's thoughts on the subject. Indeed, uh, irrigators direct water, Fletchers straighten their arrows, carpenters straighten their wood, but we wise people train themselves it's a nice verse, I mean regardless of the story it's really a useful one to, to describe the practice of insight meditation, straightening the mind or the practice of goodness in general because all types of goodness straighten the mind, right? we talk about the crookedness of the mind we talk about someone who is crooked right? we have this sense that the mind of a person uh, is, who does evil deeds is not straight, it's crooked and so we talk about goodness as straightening the mind because a good person doesn't have as much complication to them right? it's more complicated when you tell a lie or when you live by lies or when you live by deception or when you live by manipulation it's more complicated when you hurt others it's more complicated the more you need, the more you're addicted to. It's complicated when you are stingy. It's complicated when you are jealous. It's complicated. It becomes all twisted and tied. It's complicated when you hold views and beliefs, right? This is the criticism we have of other religions, is they have all these unnecessary beliefs that complicate things, that tie them up in knots, trying to describe why this belief is necessary to go to heaven, how you can... Uh, justify that belief that has no evidence to support it and so on whereas goodness, pure goodness straightens the mind so this is what wise people do they spend time straightening their mind another word is that the Buddha uses is dituju straightening, them, straightening one's view straightening the way one looks at the world so another aspect of straightening is 
what we do in vipassana to see things as they are, to not have misconceptions about reality. So to not see things that are impermanent as permanent, to not see things that are unsatisfying as satisfying, to not see things that are not self as self. So to not cling to things that are not not capable of satisfying. To learn to let go and to flow with life, not get stuck on things. So that's the teaching. Not much more you can say about it, except that's what we're doing, is straightening our minds with all of the cultivation of goodness that we do. And so this is the goal that we have. When we think about Buddhism, the Buddha's teaching, we should really think in terms of this straightness, goodness, um, rightness, knowledge and wisdom, and being in line with the truth of reality. Because once you see things as they are, then there is no potential for crookedness, for evil. You see that it's a complication. You see that the evil and unwholesome things are just making life more difficult for you. Are just leading to more stress and suffering. And when you learn to let go and, and free yourself, you free yourself from suffering. Untie the knots. Anto jata bahi jata jata ya jatita baja. With the inner knots and the outer knots, this generation is entangled up in knots. Ko imang wichataye jatang. Who indeed will free themselves from this tangle? So it's through the practice of morality, concentration, and wisdom that we untangle the tangle and free ourselves from crookedness. Training our minds just like people train inanimate objects. If they can do it with inanimate things, why can't we do it with the mind? That was the novice's reasoning at seven years old. So, it should put us all to some shame and make us think, why am I not having such profound thoughts? Why am I not engaging in the practice that leads to straightness of mind? and we should undertake it in earnest. So that's the Dhammapada teaching for today. Thank you all for tuning in. Wishing you all a great practice and progress on the path to peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. Thank you.